just announced their Black Friday sale. They're releasing new doorbusters every weekday, plus up to 50% off cutting-edge tech for your business. There's no better time to upgrade your small business with the latest laptops and desktops with Intel Core processors, plus there's free shipping on everything. Yes, everything. Give Dell Technologies advisors a call. They'll identify the right tech solution for your business. Call 877-ASK-DELL or go to dell.com slash Friday. That's 877-ASK-DELL. Listen to AM560, The Answer, online at 560theanswer.com, on the AM560 mobile app, on your Alexa-powered smart speaker, on TuneIn, iHeart, and radio.com. 807, Team Huckberg Traffic Center time, and Jim. Inbound Eisenhower traffic is messy from Wolf Road to 25th Avenue, where the right lane remains blocked after a major crash, which happened earlier this morning. The trip time is now 55 minutes from 390 to downtown, Outbound 45 with Gaper's delay from Central to 25th. Inbound Kennedy traffic gets heavy Cumberland to Central and Ohio to the Burn Circle. 28 minutes, so here to downtown. 12 from Montrose, 8 in the Express. Outbound 26 minutes downtown to the airport, the Stevenson. Looking at 32 minutes, 355 to Lakeshore Drive. The ride is 21 minutes from 95th to downtown. I-80 westbound, we see delays to Ridgeland to before LaGrange Road after a collision. That's traffic. I'm Jim Palamonte on AM 560, The Answer. Chicago's Morning Answer continues next. AM 560 Weather Center forecast with Steve Williams. Today, mostly sunny. It'll be warm. The high today at 68. Partly cloudy tonight, low 52. Partly sunny, warm day tomorrow. The high 66. Sunny, warm day on Friday with a high 70. I'm Steve Williams on AM 560, The Answer. 53 at O'Hare. Next news at 8.30. Chicago's Morning Answer with Dan and Amy continues next on AM 560, The Answer. This hourly segment is brought to you by HealthQuest Radio with Dr. David Kobaba. Every Saturday morning at 11, right here on AM 560, The Answer. This is Chicago's Morning Answer with Dan Proft and Amy Jacobson on AM560, The Answer. Top of the morning, Dan and Amy, and results uh, starting to come in again. This is These are results from Wayne County in uh, Michigan. So this is you know Detroit. This is a three to one Dem to Republican County. Now Trump is down in Michigan. He's down 10,000 votes, two-tenths of a percentage point. But again, we have Kent, Macomb, and Roe counties, Republican-leaning counties, that uh, have substantial portions of their vote that has yet to report. So I, I think we're still tracking for a couple of thousand votes either way. And now Nevada's in play, right? Just well, it's always that. been in play. But, yeah, Nevada right now, Trump is down six-tenths of a point. He's down uh, a little less than 8,000 votes. And interestingly, we haven't really talked about this scenario because, you know, on paper it would be less likely. He can still he can lose Wisconsin Mm -hmm. where he's down. He can lose Michigan where he's down. And if he uh, wins Georgia, North Carolina, which he seems poised to win and Pennsylvania and Nevada, he's right on the number 270. Oh, my God. So this is so there is another path technically for him, um, though it is. you know, but perhaps uh, more treacherous than you otherwise might want it. Yeah. But uh, but you're killing me over here. But uh, uh, that that's how close these races right. are. Uh, a couple of thousand votes. And and there's only two thirds of uh, precincts reporting in Nevada, where, as I said, Michigan is uh, closing in. Uh, Wayne County looks like they're moving uh, quickly to report the outstanding vote there. And then you've got those other counties I mentioned, which are Republican leaning. So we will keep you updated on all this. For more on what has transpired so far and what still may, we're pleased to be joined by Rich Lowry, editor of National Review, Fox News contributor and author of The Case for Nationalism, How It Made Us Powerful, United and Free. Rich, thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. Hey, I warrant it's been a crazy night in the morning, so I'm actually doing this from a moving car. So if, if okay. you hear some weird sounds or I drop out, that's the reason why. But I'm with you. All right. Is it one of those uh, Google self-driving cars so you can do one thing at a time? (laughs) Uh, So the case for nationalism, that's your book. Uh, You may have only about four days to continue to make it before this is prohibited. Uh, So you you better make it. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah. So look, th- this Trump turned out the vote. Uh, you know, I, I didn't discount he could do this because um, after 2016, I, I adopted a posture of modesty and suspicion <laughs> of the polls going forward. But even I was a little skeptical. I was talking to a top Trump guy. I think it was like two or three weeks ago, pretty much near the, the trough. You know, I mean, the national polls coming out, I think that had him down double digits. And, and this guy said, oh, we just got off the phone with all, all our team and, and all the key states. And they all say they feel better than, than they did in 2016. I was like, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, tell me another one. But there was a lot to that. And this is, this is an amazing achievement to get this close. Now, the, the question is, can he, can he get over the top and their paths? Um, but I think you probably have to favor Biden slightly uh, where we are r- right at the moment. Um, but but th- this thing is going to ha- hang on really narrow results in a couple of states, obviously. But I mean, wasn't it more of an anti-Trump vote, though, than a, a vote for Biden? Because if you look at your Twitter feed, I mean, I've never seen a Biden supporter post anything pro-Biden. It was always just anti-Trump. Yeah, I think that showed up in the exit polls. Maybe, was, you know, 80 percent of Trump voters were voting for Trump and then maybe 54 percent or something were, were voting for Biden. And I think we don't know who's going to be president as of this moment. But I think we have learned what the contours of Biden presidency will be if he wins, because it seems very likely now that Republicans will hold the Senate. That will neuter a Biden presidency from the beginning. You're not getting any court packing. You're not getting any adding any additional states. You're not getting, you know, a gargantuan stimulus package. You're not getting the John John Lewis Voting Rights Act. You're not getting any of that. Uh, So Biden will be able to engage in uh, uplifting rhetoric and executive actions. But otherwise, legislatively, he's, he's neutered from the beginning. He's going to be a kind of a caretaker president, even if he gets in. So, so, so this night has forestalled the worst of all scenarios, which would be unified democratic governance. And that's, that's no small thing. Uh, it's not a small thing, but uh, by the same token, I, I keep you know, sort of pushing this, uh, this idea. Uh, think how far the left has advanced their cultural agenda in the last four years without the White House and without the Senate. Now, maybe, you know, if they have the White House as is a possibility, uh, how much more they will and, and a caretaker as that, as you describe, beholden to the Marxist uh, base of that party. Think how far they could advance that agenda just with executive orders. Yeah, well, clearly in this scenario, Biden would go further than Obama, go further than Trump in governing unilaterally and probably won't be a peep from his side. You know, that there wasn't when Obama rewrote uh, immigration law unilaterally. So they'd they'd all accept it. But there are on that. There are limits. And but but clearly that this cultural factor was a huge subterranean issue in the election. Subterranean, not for people like us who are aware of it, but subterranean and, and the rest of the coverage. This was clearly there was a, a silent majority or silent plurality out there that was um, keeping their heads down because this is a time when you, know, you say the wrong thing in Facebook, you can get fired from your job and was just waiting to, to give the one symbol and expression of defiance that they could. And that was voting for Donald Trump. And that, that's that's another reason I think he he exceeded what what people think he could do in terms of turning out his vote. Yeah, it, it, the binary I suggested was the utopians uh, versus the uh, versus Václav Havel's green grocers. So there w- whether the re- revolt of the green grocers was big enough, we're, we're, we're yet to see. But but clearly that was a part of it. Clearly, this is something that is afoot as more and more people run into the sort of um, uh, oppressive culture that uh, the left uh, seeks to advance. And it, it is advancing. Yeah, and it's also a sign that Trump's going to have staying power. You know, the, the, the worst case scenario for him was a big landslide loss, you know, and the Senate's washed out and, and Democrats make generational policy advances in the wake of his uh, embarrassing defeat. And that, and that didn't happen. And it, it's clear that some version of Trump's path is the path for the Republican Party going forward. Now, you, d- you don't want to be as uh, uh, a radioactive in the suburbs, as, as Trump made himself. That's obviously something that the party has to deal with going forward. But, you know, I always thought Trump loses, and if he's one-term president, we'll never see him at a Republican convention. I don't think that's true uh, uh, anymore. And 
again, we, we, I, I shouldn't. I'm speaking as though he's going to lose. We don't know yeah, that right. at all. No, right. No, we're just playing on hypotheticals. That's right. I think we gave the proper predicate that it's a f- coin flip or something approximating that right now. But it's interesting you say that because, uh, you know, I mean, there, there are a, a, a few never Trumpers that write over at your publication, National Review. And, and if Trump were to lose, then, you know, then it's time to, OK, so what's the Republican Party going to be in the post-Trump era? And I think there's a, a desire to, to maybe discard much of what has transpired over the last four years. Well, um, you're, you're not going to be able to do that if you want to stop the advance of the left. Yeah. So, you know, we're divided on this internally. We have different writers with different takes on it. We have some folks that are just frank restorationists mm-hmm. and think mm-hmm. the, the whole Trump thing is, is a wrong turn. It's a weird aberration and the party should snap back. And, you know, as, as you know, we've talked about this over the years. I'm uncomfortable with a lot of things Trump does and, and some substantive things as well. But I don't think the party's ever going way all the way back. I don't think it should go all the way back. Uh, and and this is another sign that it, that's not going to happen. And and with respect to the suburbs, you know, being less radioactive in the suburbs, you know, I, I get what that means to some extent. I get that what, what that means as a criticism of Trump. I'm not sure I understand exactly what it means as an overture to the p hat wearing, man hating shrews in uh, the leafy suburbs. I I don't know what exactly the appeal is supposed to be to people who are that wildly and proudly ignorant, frankly. And, and probably the yeah, appeal so, the, and, the, and the appeal definitely isn't what I just said to them. But I mean, I'm you know, trying to get to so how, how do you approach people who have completely given in to identitarian politics? Yeah, well, they're they're lost. Um, uh, you're never going to get them. But the, the trick will be, again, if, tr- if Trump loses and uh, we're, we're in coin flip territory, you know, if you're Tom Cotton or you're Josh Hawley, you're, you're going to pick up. Much of Trump's substantive substance, certainly directionally, you're going to go the same way. But you're you're not going to be tweeting outrageous things the way Trump did. You know, you're going to be more polite, sort of across the board. And the hope would be you hold Trump's voters, and then make make some inroads um, in, into the suburbs. But another really encouraging thing that we should hit is the amazing victory in Florida driven by gains among Latinos yes. mm-hmm. that didn't just happen in, in Florida, it happened in other states as well. And this is a sign that a more populous Republican Party can uh, cross racial lines, ironically, in, uh, in a way that a more stereotypical Republicanism can't. So the promise for the party going forward, more working class orientation, and that's not just a white working class. It can pick up working class uh, Latinos and black, especially uh, black and Latino men. You know, Rich, uh, I spoke with my dad. I do it's my ritual every night before an election. And he said that he didn't think Trump was going to win, not how he handled the coronavirus, but his attitude toward it that might have turned off some people that voted for him in 2016. Do you think there's any truth to that? You, you know, I, I think this, this remains to be sussed out. But I was shocked by the, the exit polls last night. And, you know, grain of salt on all exit polls. But showing COVID didn't really show up much as an issue. Really? You know, I think it was maybe one one in five voters said it was the main thing they were they were voting on. So it may have been. I, I think all that. I, I assumed it really hurt him. All that stuff fighting with Fauci, even if you don't like Fauci, why do it? But it it may have been that was just a relative non factor. You know, it may be just people kind of realize that actually, end of the day, there's not a huge amount a, a president can do about this. You know, Biden's policies aren't going to be radically different than Trump's. So, you know, he'll be more comfortable wearing a mask. But how much of a difference does that make? So we'll, we'll see maybe when we get more more data later on. But I, I'm surprised how it, it may not have played the major role I thought it would have. Now, obviously, it shaped conditions, and it would have been better if the economy didn't take the huge hit it did. Um, but it remains to be seen. Right. And, and uh, we were talking about this a bit with uh, Steve Moore earlier in the program. One of the other things is just the number of people who cast their ballots before Trump's barnstorming close in the last, uh, yeah. you know, three weeks yeah. in particular. And and, uh, you know, if you're talking about a couple of states divided by a few thousand votes, uh, that's a, a big difference maker, too. Yeah. And and just his power as a campaigner, you know, I, I think it's 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 underestimated. And, and you look at those rallies and the media would always focus on the gaps, and you know, the sort of the wacky things you would say. But they were hugely entertaining, and they're almost entirely on message, actually. You know, there are a lot of riffs to keep people uh, engaged. But this was true in 2016 as well. 
in, in a way, it makes it seem so easy. It makes it seem as though you can do anything, you know, for years. And then as long as you campaign really hard the last two weeks, you win or almost win, you know. <laughs> and uh, and so he's he's to give him, be given credit for those rallies. And again, the get out the vote effort, which was quite extraordinary. And it, it might fall short here, but if he gets over the top, that's the reason why they did the legwork, they did the phone calls, they did the door knocking when Biden ad- adopted this defensive crouch and just uh, assumed he could uh, um, campaign you from know, his basement, break this thing out. Mm. He is Rich Lowry, editor of National Review, Fox News contributor, author of The Case for Nationalism, How It Made Us Powerful, United, and Free. Rich, thanks for joining us. All right. Let's hope for the best. Yep. Thank you. And he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. You're listening to Chicago's Morning Answer with Dan Proft and Amy Jacobson on AM560, The Answer. We're all aware of national dealers that sell gold and silver. But national dealers? It sounds so impersonal and far away. Guess what? Fox Valley Coins in Naperville is a national dealer, and they're right here in our backyard. With Fox Valley Coins close by, you won't have to relinquish your personal information and money through the mail and hope that you receive what you ordered in the next days, weeks, or months. Most of the time at Fox Valley Coins, you just walk in the store, pick out what you want, pay for it, and walk out the door. It can be that easy. 